Good evening again, and welcome to our second annual Be the Change celebration again, as Ben already stated. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Just like it says right there in your program, I'm Drew Martin, founding principal of our second middle school, Rise Academy. Uh, you know, when I was asked to be the MC for this event, it was made pretty clear to me that I was going to have to change a few things. Drew, no more talking on the fly, I was told. I always make people from our network nervous when I give tours to visitors because they never know what I'm going to say. So I'm changing tonight. I've written down some thoughts. I'm going to stick to the script. Ben, of course, is a little bit nervous right now because this change to the script wasn't in there on Sunday when we practiced. <laughs> Relax, Ben. Everything is going to be fine. <laughs> I'm committed to changing. I'm going to be serious for six minutes straight. For those people who will have the pleasure or displeasure to sit with me at dinner, please recognize that my six minutes will be up once I've completed my MC responsibilities. <laughs> and I apologize in advance. You know, I emphasize the word change in the last minute because there's a lot of talk of change in this country right now. Change we can believe in. We've got to change Washington. Healthcare needs to be... Change. There we go. So much talk about change that the name of this event, Be the Change, probably seems a bit cliche by now. Unfortunately, for hundreds of thousands of young people in our nation's lowest performing schools, there's little that is changing and much that remains the same. In cities around the country, African American and Hispanic students are falling three years behind by eighth grade, four years behind by high school, and if they finish high school, they're not finishing prepared to pass basic standards for graduation, much less go on to college. In cities like Newark, if you are born poor, the odds are more than 10 to 1 you will never earn a college degree. And in a global economy of ever-growing competitive pressures, being robbed by poor preparation of the chance to earn a college degree will likely ensure that you live in poverty as an adult, raise children in poverty, and send them to the same sorts of schools to fall behind again and continue the cycle of poverty. In fact, for most students of color in this country, change has been insufficient for decades. Over 50 years ago, the reforms of Brown versus the Board of Education attempted to address shameful inequalities in the resources provided to separate and unequal schools. Today, the school systems of Newark and its surrounding suburbs are disgraceful reminders of how little progress has been made in integrating our nation's schools and how unequal those separate systems continue to be in the academic results they produce. Today, that inequality in the caliber of education persists, but in a very new form. In South Carolina in the 1950s, black students walked miles and white students took the bus, a result of a school system that spent 10 times more on educating white students than blacks. While the Abbott lawsuit of the early 90s mandated that Newark become one of the best funded public school districts in the country, it continues to deliver an education that is tragically unequal in its outcomes. 50 years ago, the legal structure of our nation's schools necessitated a radical new approach. Today, we see an opportunity to continue the fight to abolish inequitable results through a radical new approach within our schools. The problems facing schools in our poorest communities have come to be viewed by some as intractable or insurmountable. But there is evidence in this room today that a true sea change is underway. The students you will meet today represent a new wave in the civil rights movement. Just as their predecessors fought to desegregate schools of the last century for a chance to get a good education, they are fighting today to realize the true meaning of that dream the right to world-class educational opportunity and achievement. They are blazing a path so that here, in the city of Newark, each child will have access to a world-class, free college preparatory education in an excellent public school. <laughs> Their journey began about six years ago in a small, crumbling old school building in the South Ward of Newark. An idea took root that would begin to make this change. Maybe it was the fact that the ceiling leaked when it rained, and perhaps those drops provided nutrients that allowed this idea to grow. Maybe it was the hundred hour weeks the five teachers put in, put in tending the 80 young minds in the classroom. Or maybe it was that the students began to truly believe that they would go to college. They would 
work hard and be nice. That they would be the change. The idea that grew here is not rooted in any complicated formula. It was based on simple principles. Work hard, be nice. Got it. No shortcuts, no excuses. That's right. Work hard, be nice. No shortcuts, no excuses. College, change. It is an idea that is transforming what is thought to be possible in public education across the country. Right now, in dozens of our fellow KIPP schools in LA and DC, North Carolina and Houston, thousands of children who otherwise would have had a little chance of going to college, now going to class each day, dreaming of Harvard and Rutgers and Columbia and the University of Virginia, and making plans to be the change they wish to see in the world. So in 2002, those 85th graders entered this new school and began their long journey to reverse the achievement gap that had grown between them and put their peers in places like Montclair and Summit. They stayed each day for 10 hours in class, did two hours of homework, went to Saturday school, went to school during the summer. They sang songs about math problems, chanted about state capitals, and hiked mountains in Utah. They visited Princeton and Georgetown, Penn State and Berkeley. They built bonds of friendship and trust with their teachers, called them on their cell phones for help, and shared their hopes and aspirations with them. Today, that first class is attending Phillips Exeter, Deerfield, St. Benedict's, Montclair Kimberly Academy, Newark Academy, and too many other great private and parochial schools to name. And today, from that first route they took hold in the South Ward, a change has grown for hundreds of Newark students in three team schools. Team Academy now serves over 360 students in grades five through eight who are preparing for college and to be the change they wish to see in the world beyond. Rise Academy, the second team middle school where I work, is now serving over 180 students and will grow to 360, 360 students who are that change. And our high school, Newark Collegiate Academy, which opened this summer to serve its first class of over 70 students, is strengthening our ability to continue that change in grades 9 through 12 and will grow to serve over 500. Today, for over 600 students here in Newark attending teen schools, change is not a cliche, change is a reality. I am pleased to have the opportunity to introduce you to some of these hardworking young men and women this evening and to introduce you to some of those in Newark who have played integral roles in making this change possible. But before I do so, we have a brief snapshot of our schools for you. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> 